Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. In the next little while during worship, why don't we just commit that if the Lord leads you to step out, to move around, to find a place, that we just kind of turn this place into our own altar space, our own time of worship. One more time, can you just lift your hands? Can you just talk to the Lord? Do you feel Him in this place? He's been here. He's been here from the first moment last night. He met us this morning. Surely God is here and whatever you need. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Yeah. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all you are is all I want, yes. Will you meet me here again? If you know it, can you help me sing? I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? all I want, cause all I want is all you are, will you meet me here again, not for a minute, was I forsaken, the Lord is in this place, the Lord
you could see with heavenly eyes. I wish God would open your vision and open the eyes of your heart to see what is in this room, what miracles are available to you, how he is waiting in this place. If you would just open up your mouth, if you would just believe and have faith to receive that God has a miracle in this place for you. What do you need? from him tonight what do you need from him this weekend do you have the faith to believe that God can meet every need and supply every need according to his riches and glory yes he's in this place he's in this place he's in this place yes he's in this place he's in this place he's Jesus in the name of Jesus come on can you just press a little bit can you press into his presence yes a miracle can happen a miracle can happen a miracle can happen in this place a miracle can happen a miracle a miracle it can happen in this place a miracle a miracle a miracle can happen a miracle can happen in this place with Jesus with Jesus it will happen with Jesus it It's gonna happen. It can happen. <laughs> will happen. With Jesus it will happen. With Jesus it will happen in this place. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. Just reach out. Can you lay your hand on someone? Can you let the Lord lead you? Can you go put your hand on your friend?
Wow, what a beautiful presence of the Lord is here right now. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Man, God is so good. God is so good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Sister Amy, we're praying for you. Praying for your family, your grandfather. The most amazing thing is, is when you bring a petition to God, you release that out of your hands. What man in our finite ways can do, it will end and it will be terminated because it's eliminated and it's based upon our ability. But what God can do, what God can do is beyond what we can imagine or even think. And so we trust that God's will be done. We pray that His Spirit would be made manifest in that room. That strength would come into the body. That arms of our Heavenly Father would be wrapped around that family. and They would know that God showed up. Let me just tell you, your prayers make a difference. Luke describes it in the book of Acts that every prayer of the saint is a memorial that stands before God. So what you did tonight is you built a memorial. The Bible also tells us that prayer, the prayer of the saints, every word that you utter to God in prayer, it ascends before the very throne of God. Revelation tells us that an angel comes down and captures every one of your prayers and places those prayers in a golden censer. Begins with great detail to explain that at the appointed time, and that's the pivotal moment, the appointed time, that the angel takes every one of those prayers and pours it out on an altar. The Bible says that something happens at that altar. There's some sort of spontaneous combustion that takes place. And an incense savor begins to lift off of it. And God breathes it in. It says it, it penetrates his nostrils. And in that moment, God has remembrance. And what happens next, Revelation described, that after he has remembrance of those prayers, the earth begins to quake, lightning begins to flash, thunder begins to roar. So that tells me that your prayers in heaven are stored for a moment and then God releases it and it affects the earth that we live on. So don't be discouraged if your prayer does not get answered now. There's coming a time and in His wisdom, God answers every prayer according to His will. And so we don't pray what our will is. We pray what His... And that's not a lack of faith. That is not a lack of faith. That is the greatest of faith. That's the step beyond faith, maybe you could even say, where you trust God enough to say, whatever happens is in your hands and it's right. So don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Man, I feel the presence of the Lord here so strong. I want you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke. And, and I'm just going to read one pass, uh, verse out of here. And, uh, and then after I read one, I'm just going to, uh, I want you to leave that open. And we're just going to work our way through uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. And, and this is a very familiar passage of Scripture with you. It's... It has a name. We've, we've called it a name that's not really in Scripture, but it's the concept that's there. We, uh, we look at this, and what I'm going to preach tonight, you, you may feel that, uh, and I wrestled with this, but I felt so strongly. You may feel, well, I don't, I don't really understand what he's trying to say about me. I'm not a father, but it's not, it's not the role of the father that I want to talk about. It's the role of the son. And so I want us to turn to chapter 15 of Luke. And we'll begin reading in verse 11. And so here it is. And he said, this is Jesus, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. So we have the demand given by the youngest son. And he's wanting his inheritance. 
So in essence, he's telling the father, your death has not come quick enough for me. And so I want what you would give me at your death. Not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him to his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's house have bread to eat and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I want us to pray one more time. And, and this is what I want to preach to you today. I want to preach to you about a, a revelation of identity. Can we one more time just ask the Lord to help us? God, we thank you for your presence we've felt. The moment we walked into this place and began to call upon your name. I pray for strength of body and mind. I pray, Lord, that you would begin to minister to each and every person that's here in a very unique and special way. Because, God, you know what we cannot know. You know the heart and you know the trial. and You know the thoughts that race through our mind even. And I pray, Lord, that you would lift us up and bring us into unity so that we can see your spirit and your presence do the greatest work by giving you authority and giving you liberty in our heart to just minister to us in whatever way that you see fit. I pray, God, that you touch our ears to hear our hearts to receive. And I pray, oh Lord, that your will, your perfect will be done in every life that's here that would open themselves up and say, here I am, Lord. Do as you would. We give you glory and honor. And everyone said in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We have such an incredible scripture that we could begin to pull the nuggets that God has given us through his word. And the word of God is this powerful written script that has been preserved, been preserved from heaven itself. It's not just inspired, it's God breathed. I believe that the Word of God is the infallible, inerrant Word. That it does not change, it does not make mistakes, but God has forever preserved it in heaven. It's been settled in heaven. The Bible tells us in itself that this Word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder the very thought and the intent of the heart. It penetrates into the morrow of the bone. Sometimes the word of God is uncomfortable because it exposes who we are and what we have done. But the difference between the word of God and what man would impose is that God's word never operates outside of conviction and it never moves into condemnation because that is not what God's word does. You see, the difference between the two is condemnation will send you running away because you cannot see or comprehend a merciful God. But conviction allows us to come and to deal with the issues of our life that we have transgressed against His Word, knowing that God is a gracious God and a loving God. And He died for every sinner that has ever lived so that He, they, the sinner, That God can forgive sins and wash away by His blood at the simple asking of that, please forgive me, can wash away by His blood in baptism every sin that we have committed in our life. And so when we begin to open up the Word of God, we see something that is so powerful, so incredible, that demonstrates God's love. Because God does not want you to stay where you are, but God wants you to come to a conclusion that I must be who God has called me to become. And it's by His grace and mercy that God allows us to be recipients of what His Word states. So God's word forever settled in heaven. God's word has the ability to lift up, reverse the circumstances of this world. When the enemy comes against you, there's nothing greater that you can do than to begin to pray or quote the word of God. 
Because greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. The Bible tells us that at the mentioning of his name, (laughs) every demon in hell has to flee. Ladies and gentlemen, you have not tapped into the potential that you possess. It's not through your might. It's not through your power, but it's through his word. Thus saith the Lord. So when the enemy comes against you and may attack your family, may attack your mind, anxiety may be gripping you to the place where you can't breathe. Fear may be breathing down your neck. You need to realize this, that God has created something so so powerful, so revelatory through his word. If you open yourself up and allow it to live through you, then God can set you free. God can deliver you. God can transform you. God can prepare you for a greater future. The enemy would lie to you and tell you that you're not able, but God's already deemed it possible that if you submit yourself to his will, you can do what God has asked you to do. So it's through this word. It's through this word that we understand the being of God. And through the being of God is what gives us the life and the breath and the ability to live for God. When we open up this incredible passage of scripture of the prodigal son, I want you to take just a moment and I want you to think about how many have sat at this same youth retreat year after year and how many have walked away never to return? How many friends have you lost in your youth group and your hyphen group? I don't know what it is, but it seems as if we can get by through our high school years, but the moment we transition to hyphen... It's as if the enemy pours out everything he can to destroy our faith. And I've watched Hyphen walk out of churches person after person, mixed up and confused, fighting battles that they had the victory over at 13 and 14 years of age, but something got inside of them in their mind and began to discourage them. You know what I pray? I pray against that spirit. I pray against that spirit that would come against our youth group and our hyphen group. I pray against that spirit that would bring confusion, that would cause us to suffer in our identity and our understanding of what our identity is. Let me just speak to identity. Let me tell you this, your identity matters. Your identity cannot be fluid. You know why? Because God has a specific purpose for your life. And if you get so confused about who and what you are, you'll allow the enemy to convince you that you are nothing more than just a pronoun. You are not just a pronoun. You are a child of God. He formed you and created you in his image. God has a purpose for your life. So when we look at this passive scripture, the prodigal son, the Bible tells us that here's a young man that insulted his father. It, it, it's more than just a culture understanding. This is, this is basic, basic understanding that we as, as Americans can grasp, not even living in, in that part of the world, that how insulting it would be for him to ask of his father what only should be given at his father's death. His father was gracious and what we don't even sometimes uh, dissect here in this passage of scripture is the offense that his father could have taken at his son asking for his inheritance so that he could enjoy life. Lamenting that his dad hadn't died sooner so he could go and take the money and live the way he wanted to live. We, We never see in scripture because it's the way it's been written. It's the parable of this story that that God is trying to show us his grace and mercy. Let me just say this. You cannot offend God. You cannot cause God to stop loving you. I want you to get that in your mind. I think probably the greatest thing that keeps people from coming back to church It's not that they don't necessarily have a way back. It's because they feel that God doesn't love them because of what they've done. Let me tell you, no, that's not the way God operates. God loves you no matter what you've done. 
He loves you no matter where you've went. He loves you no matter what you've become. But God doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to come home. He wants to redeem you. He wants you to set, be set free. God wants to transform you. And so we, we don't really get to that place. But the Father gave the Son what He was not required to give. I wonder how many times we've asked of God and God's given us what He didn't want us to have at that moment. That's why we pray the will of God. And we don't demand of God. Because his, his example right here is that we ask something and God gave it knowing that we were going to do something with it that was not going to be pleasing and beneficial. Think of it like this. When Jesus fed the multitude and, and, and those thousands of people were fed with, with the loaves and the fishes, He tells the disciples to get into a boat and He sends them across the Sea of Galilee. Y'all remember the story? the feeding of the 5,000, and sends them across the Sea of Galilee. We know that God does this. He knows the beginning and the end. He operates out of the constraints of time. God knows the path that you take. God knows every decision that you make. I believe He holds a veil in front of that because He chooses not to so that He can continue to give mercy and grace. And He knows the beginning from the end. We know that. And he sends the disciples on a journey across the Sea of Galilee knowing what is going to happen next in their life. Because in the middle of that sea, there's a storm that's going to arise and they're going to cry out for fear because they are afraid they're going to die. And what is Jesus doing? He retreats up into the hills to have a Sabbath rest. Knowing that his rest will be interrupted by the cry of fear from his disciples. And that's when he responds and walks on the water. You see, sometimes we ask of things and we demand of things and, and God allows it to happen. You know why? So that we get to the place where we realize that we can't do this on our own. Sometimes God does give you the desire of your heart, even though the desire of your heart is not accurate. It's not what God wants. And this is what the disciples are, are seeing now when they're in the boat and they're crying out and he walks on the water to save them. This is what the prodigal son experienced, I believe, when he asked, I want my inheritance now. And the father gave him that inheritance you pray for it, God will give it to you. And you can mess your life up. You pray for your spouse saying, God, I want her. I want him. And guess what? God may allow that to happen, but it'll end in destruction of your soul potentially. You need to pray God's will be done. God, whatever your will is. God, is this job right for me? Is this career path right for me? Is this education path right for me? God, what is your will? That's how we must pray. And so in the prodigal son, he asks and he's given. He takes the substance, he takes all that he has, and he goes out into a far country, travels a long ways. It's amazing how he, he's there in a strange place and he begins to live his life the way that he has wanted to live his life. Righteous living, consuming it upon his own lust, his own desires, whatever his heart desires, whatever his lust leads him, he takes and does. It's incredible that at the moment that the moment that he gets to this place and his money, I don't know if it was weeks or months or years that passed by, but all that he had from his father, who was a very wealthy man we see in Scripture, all that he had, he spent it all, and now he has nothing. He's a resourceful young man, no doubt. I, I, I would have to say that he's probably a, a dominant driver if you look at the disc personality test. And he, he's forceful. He asks. He gets. He could probably go get a job, could he not? He, he, he asks his father the hardest question, give me my inheritance now. He's unintimidated to put himself out. But, but yet at the moment that he runs out of all of his money and all of his good, what happens? There's a famine in the land. So this young man that may have potential, he may have skill, he may have assertiveness, he may have the right part personality, but he cannot even get a job because at the moment that he loses all of his money, there's a famine and now there's no job and there's no... Let me tell you something. You think that 
when you get to the end of your road that God just reverses the curse or changes the circumstances. No, you know what he does? You get to the end of it and you begin to realize that circumstances have gotten even worse. You run out of money and now a land that you're in has famine. You get to a place where you've exhausted all of your resources and now God has led you to a place where you have nothing to eat and you have no hope of tomorrow. You know why? Because God will get you to a place where you're absolutely miserable and you can't even see a way out and the only answer is for you to have a revelation of who you are so here he is no money and now a famine so he violates everything that he is his identity his heritage his lineage the people the descendants the commandments that has been taught to him since a small child, barely even old enough to understand. The Torah was, was emphatically emphasized in that home. The Word of God was nailed and scribed to the doorpost of the house that he lived in. I wonder if he wore that around his arm and had it as a frontlet upon his forehead. And what he knows he should not do, he's desperate. He doesn't see a solution. And so the very thing that is unclean that he cannot touch, he now goes and joins himself to a countryman and says, I'll do anything for substance of life. Let me just say this. Sometimes people that are against you, it's not because they're hating you. It's just simply they're for themselves. Because desperation causes people to violate their core value. And people you're connected to, if they're violating core values, maybe that's not the time to be offended and walk away from them. But maybe it's the time to reach for them and help them because they're desperate and they have no place else to turn to. And so he's violating his core values and he goes down to a, to a hog pen and he's now touching and, and helping the very thing that is unclean that he's forbidden to touch. And he's even contemplating picking up and, and grabbing that, that filthy, st stagnant and, and, and mildew infested and rotting food that those hogs will eat. And he reaches down to pull up a handful of it because his stomach is crying out for substance. And he's now going to step even further down this hole of compromise, of giving in to the urging of the flesh and violating his identity. Oh, hear me, the enemy wants you to violate your identity and who you are and everything that God has called you to become. God didn't call you to go out and touch things that are unclean. God did not call you to go and to rub shoulders with people that are unclean. God calls you to be separate and to come out. Oh, we heard a word this morning and, and last night apparently and even this afternoon God is calling us to come out of this world and be separate. We need to be a light in this dark hour because we need to let people know that there is an option. You, you can live a life of holiness and righteousness and purity before God. You can rise to the occasion that God has called you to. Before he can even put that into his mouth, something begins to settle upon him. This, this idea, how fascinating is it? He's holding that slop that's in his hand. It begins to ooze through his fingers and drop back into the mud from which he pulled it. He said, there's servants in my father's house. There's servants in my father's house that eat better than these pigs eat. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the revelation of identity. Isn't it amazing how he, he identified with the servant and not as a son? Isn't it incredible that he, he said, you know what, I, I don't deserve to come back to dad's home and be called his son. I, I deserve to be a servant in my father's house. Oh, I've heard preachers preach against this, but you know what? I don't think it's such a bad idea. I, I understand there's the bloodline there. He's, he's his father's son. He has a right to everything that's in that home. But he says, I, I, I believe that these servants 
in my father's house can eat better and have a better life than I have here. So I'll just go back and be a servant. Let, let, me, let me say, this is what God wants us to become like. God wants us to be at the place where we wake up in our stupor, in our sin and realize I know that I'm still the son. I know that I'm still the daughter. I know that I'm still the child. But guess what? I'll just become a servant in my father's house. It's when you begin to be content with just being a servant in your father's house is when God is going to begin the greatest process of restoration in your life. Second Samuel, chapter five. Think, look, at, look at it like this. David has been running from this mad king for over 32 years. Saul was a perverted, wicked king that had walked away from the presence of God. God chose a man after his own heart, David was anointed. And for 32 years, there was a battle that was being fought and David was running for his life. He was anointed king, but the position hadn't been given to him. And in chapter 5, verse 12, after Saul is dead, and a seven-year war takes place between Saul's family and the rest of Israel, years after, Years after, Judah had declared him king. Now we find that the rest of Israel joined together. And Saul is dead. And a battle has been won. Chapter 5 and 14, And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel. And that he had exalted his kingdom for the people of Israel's sake. And the moment that his perception of David shifted, it shifted from what to king. Something happened. Because in the very next verse, he violates one of the greatest commandments that was given to man. In verse 13, and David took him more concubines and wives out of Israel. And it was at the moment that David perceived himself to be king. So what did God want David to perceive himself to be? I always thought it was shepherd. But 54 times in Psalms, it says the word. And 14 times when it describes David in Psalms 119, it says the word servant. David constantly referred to himself, not as the shepherd, but as the servant of the Lord. Oh, hear me. You know what God wants you to perceive yourself as? Oh, I get it. You're a child. But guess what? He wants you to see yourself as the servant to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, I wish I could say that ministry is glamorous and being a part of it is glamorous. But God wants you to get in here and work for the kingdom. You've got to begin to perceive yourself as the servant. That's why this prodigal said, I know that I'm the son. That, that can't be taken away from me. But I'll just be a servant. I'll just go back to daddy's house and, and at least get something to eat but I'll put work in. I'll serve my dad's house. I'll be the best servant he's ever had. I just want to go back home. Ladies and gentlemen, it's okay to pick yourself up out of a pig pen and walk back home saying, I'll just be a servant. I don't deserve any more. I'm not asking for any more. It's when we make demands of God is when our spirit's wrong and we perceived ourselves to be something that we're not and we're setting ourselves up for failure and not success. But he wants you to be a servant. There needs to be somebody here tonight that it says, I'm coming back to him. I've made a mess of my life. My past is a, is a wreck, but I'm coming back to him. And I don't expect him to view me anything more than a servant because I'm ready now to give my life into the service of the Father. Yes. So he makes his way back home. Think about this. The Bible says that he's, he's a long ways away. Took a far journey into a far country. He didn't just get up and walk down the street and there was dad's home. No, 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 no. He couldn't get on an airplane and just, 
just maybe an hour or two flight from Tel Aviv, just, just laying back in the field next to his father's house and jump out and walk up. You see, this was a journey. He, he was a long ways away. He had to, he had to maybe uh, obtain some means. I, I wonder if he walked this far. I wonder, wonder if he maybe got a boat and had to take a boat or, or what happened. But it was a far country, a far journey, and he had to make his way. Let me just say, you, don't expect when you come back to God or somebody gets back to God, we should never expect them instantaneously just to be right where they need to be. When you're making your way back, it's okay if you still have to deal with some of the issues of the life that you used to live. It's all right to have some battles that you have to fight. And it's okay for us to identify some of those battles as friends and say, you know what? They're, they're on their way back, Brother, Brother Samuel. They may not be where they need to be, but we're going we're gonna to reach them where they are. We're going to embrace them where they are. You know what I would say? Stop judging the prodigals that are out there trying to get back. Stop passing judgment and saying, well, they're still not where they should be. They missed a couple services here and there. They're still struggling with some addiction. No, no, no. You know what we should do? We should watch for where they are and meet them where they're at because the journey sometimes takes a while. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, what would happen? What would happen to our church? What would happen to our church if God began to bring the prodigals back? You know what would happen to your church? You wouldn't have enough seats to put people in your church. You know what would happen to your church? You'd have to go to mere services on Sunday and then a third service on Sunday and a fourth service on Sunday. And that's just if God began to bring the prodigals back. That is not us reaching lost souls. That's not us reaching people that didn't know. But that's just the prodigals. You know what I believe? God wants to restore the prodigals. God wants to bring the prodigals back. But who's going to be waiting for the prodigal? Who's going to be reaching for the prodigal? Who's going to meet the prodigal where they are? Who's going to teach the Bible study to the prodigal? Who's going to tell the prodigal it's okay that you've got struggles. We're here for you as the church. Don't tell me it's the pastor's responsibility. Don't tell me it's the youth pastor's responsibility. Don't tell me it's the youth staff responsibility. No, it's our responsibility. We're servants. God has called us to serve. God has called you to reach. God has called you to minister. There needs to be someone that starts a Bible study when you get home on Sunday night. You need to have that Bible study locked in by Monday. You need to be reaching for a prodigal. It doesn't matter how bad their house stinks. It doesn't matter how messed up they are. It doesn't matter how drug addicted. They, they seem to be. It doesn't matter how blitzed out of their mind they are that day. You know what you need to do? You need to walk into their room and tell them God still loves you. He's still reaching for you. Come on, prodigal. It's time to come home. You may be a backslider, but God still loves you. So he made his way back. He rose his story, you know the story, he's, he's walking towards his father's house and his father's watching. I wonder how many times he went and stood outside watching to see if maybe, maybe. His father was watching, it had to be. That's a, that's a somewhat of a safe conclusion because at a far off, he's, he spotted that boy. Oh, I can promise you he didn't look the way he did when he left. He had fine apparel, he he had the right clothes, the right shoes. He, he may have been riding the, the right brand of donkey. I don't know. He, he, he had things for him. He, he left in style. He, he left ready. He left with goods. He was loaded down. He come back though. He, he's been wallowing in the pig pen. He, he's, he's got mud on him and he's dirty and stinky and ripped up. Oh, here he comes. He's, he's walking down that, that road. He's had a long, long journey. He's weary. He's, he's exhausted. But, but dad's watching. Is it? Who is that? Who I, could that be? Oh, that walk looks very familiar. Oh, maybe it is. Maybe it's not. But I'm not going to stay here waiting for them to get to me. That dad was running to meet that son. Oh, hear me. I promise when the prodigals start coming back, you're going to experience a revival that you cannot even imagine. Because when the prodigal walks in, that's when God begins to reach into me. You want revival in your church? Do you want revival in your youth group? You start bringing prodigals back. You bring them in on Wednesday night. You'll have revival. 
You bring him in on Sunday, you'll have revival. You bring him in on youth service, guess what? God's spirit will be reaching for them. You're going to watch how tears begin to flow down their face. They're going to get up out of their pigment. Some of them are going to feel so convicted. God doesn't love me. He doesn't care for me. But that's where you come in because you can assure them that God can make a way right here. I, I wish I could go through. I'm out of time. I'm, I'm preaching way too long. Don't tell me that. He gets there and, and something amazing happens. Father, he's, he's given instructions to all the servants. There's six gifts that are given. I, I wish... I wish I could go in and, and talk about the significance, but we won't, of these first five. I, it doesn't say that he takes a, a shower. It doesn't say that. I, I don't know. Dad gets the robe anyways. And he puts the robe. Oh, I, 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 I can't. That's significant. Puts that robe on him. Oh, I wish I could just go in. He puts a ring on his finger. He, he, puts, he puts shoes on his feet. He says, kill the fatted calf. That's, that's four. And number five, here, here's the gift. He says, we're going to make merry. We're going to have a party. Five gifts. But these first five pale in comparison to the sixth gift. You want to know what the sixth gift is? Oh, you, you may be jumping ahead of me. You're like, no, there's, there's, there's only five. There's... There's not six. No, there is. There's a sixth gift. You see, it talks about all the things his father could bestow upon him or command to be bestowed upon him. But the greatest one is the sixth gift. You want to know what it is? It's a healthy father. All of the other five were contingent on the one. Because what would happen if daddy died? What would happen if daddy walked out on mama and said, I'm giving up on this family. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do something else. What would happen if daddy decided we're, we're packing up and we're moving out? What would happen if daddy said, you know what? One son did it. We're going to go live out in the world and go do some stuff. You know what? Then none of those other gifts would have been possible. And the prodigal would have returned home to a broken home. A home that couldn't contain him. A home that couldn't help him. Ladies and gentlemen, the sixth gift, the healthy father, that's the church. Oh, hear me. That's you. That's every one of you. You know what every prodigal needs? It doesn't need a new program. It, it doesn't need a cool service. It doesn't need lights and a fog machine. You want to know what a, what a prodigal needs when they get home? When they walk into your church, they need you to be spiritually healthy and ready to say, come on, we're going we're gonna to break out the gifts. Come on, we're going to pray with you. We're going to show you how to worship. We're going to love you until you get back to work. We need to be the healthy father. We can't compromise. Oh, you preached about it. We can't compromise what we believe. We can't compromise our identity because if we start walking away from truth, if we start walking away from our identity, then the prodigals can't get back to the home that they know. It'll be a different home with different people and it'll never suffice because it's not their family. I pray you never get tired of calling each other brother or sister. I, I know that's a weird tradition. It's like there's people that I go to church with, I don't even know their name. Their first name. I don't know it. Somebody asked me the other day, they're like, they're like, oh, uh, Brother Faulkner, what's his first name? Brother? I... <laughs> Like he's 70 years old. Even if I knew it, I'm not going to say. <laughs> you know why we do that? It's because it reminded us it, we're, we're more than just friends. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if you were, you, were you born in Illinois? You weren't. Well, that's interesting. Did, so you didn't like grow up in the Midwest? Oh, that's weird. Um, Toledo, well, that's close enough. And, uh, oh, that's odd. Anybody else born in Illinois? Well, you got family. Are you, were, were you born in Illinois? Well, oh, my word, we might be related. That's weird. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Not too far away, actually. Hallelujah. 
you know, chances are you're probably completely different than the person that's sitting next to you. We may have nothing in common, but we have everything in common. Yeah, you know why? You know why? We may have nothing in common, but we've got everything in common. Because I share DNA with you and you share DNA with me. Right. Oh, it's not through the physical. It's not through the, the, the physical bloodline, but it's through the spiritual bloodline. Right. Okay, so some of you, you walk into church and you're like, man, I come, you don't know, you don't know who I come from. I, I come from drug addicts. I, I, I come from broken homes. I, I come from horrible people. You know what? That's wonderful if you want to claim that identity. But once you've been born again, you've got a new identity. You see, you don't trace your lineage back through your DNA of the physical. You trace your lineage through the spiritual DNA. And guess what line that you come from? You come from a long line of preachers. Hey, you, guess what? You come from a long line of preachers because you trace your lineage all the way back to Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and the apostle Peter that stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, repent and be baptized every one of you. That's who you are. Guess what? You are a preacher because you got some grandfathers and some great grandfathers. You got some spiritual DNA. And so when you, you look at that prodigal, you say, hey, Hey, brother, hey, sister, come on home. You, yes, you're in the right place. This is exactly what you walked away from. And we open our arms and we bring you back in because it's still the same. There's a healthy father because we're brothers and sister and we're going to align with what the father in his house state. That's why I believe what I believe. That's why we keep preaching the way we preach. That's why we keep living the way we live. That's why we push away the world and we embrace what we have through his word. It's because the prodigal needs a healthy father. It's the revelation of identity. I'm trying to close. I, can't, I, I just got to finish this. So some of you can identify with the prodigal. So let me ask the question. I want you to be honest. How many, you, you were the prodigal. Raise your hand. You, you made a mistake. You messed up. You came back. No, li lift a hand up. Man, look at that. Aren't you thankful that the father was healthy? Aren't you thankful that it still was the same home? They still had the same family members. Aren't you thankful they were there to wrap their arms around you and say, come on. <laughs> I, I, I know you don't smell the best right now. You've been... You've been walling around in a pig pen, but we love you. We love you. You know what? It's okay if prodigals smell like marijuana or cigarette smoke or, or alcohol. It's okay if they come in and they're broken and hurt. And, and man, they've made a mess of their life. You know what? We, we, we need to get used to just hugging people that, that are different from us and saying, guess what? Aren't you glad somebody wrapped their arms around you and say, listen, listen, yeah, you, you're home now. You're home now. You don't ever have to worry. We're, we're your brother and your sister. You know what? You should never face any loneliness. There shouldn't be despair. You shouldn't walk into church feeling like the stranger. No, no, no. No, you're the prodigal that's returned. Daddy's happy. He's saying, "Come on, feel, kill the fatted calf, get the robe and the ring. Come on, we're gonna we're gonna celebrate a little bit." You know what? I wish we would start having celebrations when the prodigal would walk into our church. I, I wish we'd have celebrations when they would come back and we would give them that that assurance that guess what? It's okay. It's okay. You, you, you may you may not come in today. You may not change and transition tomorrow. You, we, we we may not be able to get you where you need to be next week or next month or even next year. But guess what? It's a journey we're going to take with you. You're here. Yes. So the first revelation of identity was the prodigal. My challenge to you is you prodigals that came back. You, you can't stay the same. You, you have to transition. Transition's painful. Because you still remember the hurt and the pain. You wake up in the middle of the night and have flashbacks. You, you wake up and still have that same addiction, the longing for that thing that you've been trying to fight and break. There may be moments that you, you fall and you make the mistake, but daddy's not there to kick you out of the house. No, no, no. He's saying, you, you're here. It's going to be okay because that's what a healthy father does. 
Now, the problem is some of us have not had healthy fathers. We, we, we've, we don't know what it is to have a dad that loves unconditionally, that sets an example. And that's why the church has to become the family. But your daddy, he's perfect. And he loves you no matter what you've done. Let me just say this. There's no damaged goods in the church. There's no one that doesn't deserve grace and mercy in the church. There's no one that doesn't deserve grace and mercy in the world. God's still reaching. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I keep coming back to this. Come on, there's somebody. You, you need to make a phone call. You, you need to get them back in church. You, you, you need to reach them and tell them, hey, I, I still love you. I, I'm dealing with a prodigal right now. He's a backslidden Pentecostal preacher's kid. And for 20 years, my wife and I have worked on this boy. And he is now in the worst place than I've ever seen him in. He is deep and dark into this sin. It's wrapped into his mind. And just a couple days ago, I reached back out to him because he's been ignoring my text and my phone call. And I talked to him and he, and he broke down on the phone. And guess what? He's been texting me every day since last week. You know what he's saying? He, he's saying, I just want somebody that's going to love me. I know I'm not where I should be. I, I know I'm making bad decisions. I'm not approving of his lifestyle and what he's done. But you want to know what? If he needs to get back, Back, I'll be the one that says, come on home. Come on home. We're, we're, we're waiting for you. Come on. You, you can make it. You, you, I, I, we'll see you coming. We'll meet you halfway. We're, 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 you don't have to even walk through the door by yourself. We're going to be there to walk with you. We need to make sure because the revelation of identity, number one, has to begin with the prodigal. There's another revelation. Because there was the older son that was in the church. And you know what happened to him? He got bitter. He said, well, well Daddy, you, you've never done all this for me. You, you, you didn't put a robe on me and give me a ring and put shoes on my feet and kill the fatted calf and, and tell everybody we're going to have a party. You, you didn't... You, you didn't do anything like that for me. You see, he was viewing himself in the wrong way. The prodigal said, I'll just be a servant when he came back. But the son that stayed viewed himself as nothing more than a servant. Because he said, I don't deserve any of this stuff. You've never done it. And what he didn't realize is what his father stated. Everything that I have is yours. Whew. Some of you that have stayed, don't get bitter when the prodigal comes in and we begin to rejoice. Because every blessing is yours. Every promise is yours. God has preserved you and kept you. Oh, let me tell you, you don't have to go out in the world to get a testimony. You staying right there in the church is your testimony to those that are coming back in. You know what? You don't have to wait for God to, to do something. God's already done it for you. He's kept you. He's saved you. He's blessed you. You need a revelation of your identity. Oh, hear me. Hear me. The world has nothing to offer except pain and suffering. The enemy, you know what he wants to do? He wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy everything in your life life. Guess what? Where you are in the church, that's the best place that you can be. You're here. The blessings of God are being poured out. Guess what? You can't be in the church without being a recipient of the blessings of God. You can't be in the church without seeing God provide and make a way and do great incredible things. Every miracle is yours. Every promise is yours. Every blessing that God's word states, it belongs to you. So the revelation of identity is this right here. I'll just encapsulate as musicians are coming. Revelation of identity. Those of you that have stayed, you need to know that God has a blessing. God has a love. God has a place. 
It's not you to identify as just the servant. You need to realize that God is wanting you to put your hands to the work, but he's also wanting you to manage the work. He's wanting you to be able to operate in his house. He's wanting, he's wanting you to identify in his house. He's wanting you to make sure that you can walk through his house and welcome prodigals back and, and help people accomplish tasks. You know what? Every one of you that's here that was raised in church, you need to be at a place that you're pouring back into the church. You need to be involved in the ministry. You, you need to be involved in giving of your time and, and your effort. You, you need to be reaching. Every one of you need to be an altar worker with, with your youth pastor and pastor's permission. You need to make sure that you can know how to pray with people and love people, teach Bible studies and help people. I'm challenging somebody. You need to start a P7 club in your school. You need to start a campus ministry at your college campus. You need to get a Bible study going at your job. You need to do something for the kingdom of God because God's going to bring back prodigals. Let me tell you a story of a prodigal. This is the power of prayer. You see, it takes, it takes the sun the boy that stayed. It really should have taken him and the father helping, developing, waiting. But unfortunately, he didn't view himself that way. I talked about prayer, and so this is what I want to tell you about prayer. This is what I want to tell you about the revelation of your identity. Annie is from Oregon, and she's a graduate of Indiana Bible College. And she shared this testimony with her, with us. She said, we just found this out a few years ago, bizarre circumstances that happened. She said, my dad thought he was first generation Pentecost. She said, it was just a few years ago that we found out that he was not. She said, we didn't know this. She said, but... My dad's mom, who I didn't meet, she said, was a backslider. And she got pregnant at 16 years of age. And she wasn't just a backslider, but she was a backslider, a Pentecostal preacher. And she ran away from home. And she vowed she would never step foot back the church and she would have nothing to do with Christianity and she lived her life under that motto that baby that she was pregnant with it grew up and when mom died that baby was now able to make its own decisions full grown man and at work somebody invited this man to church he came to church in the first service he felt the presence of God for the first time in his life but while he was in that altar he told Annie years later he said Annie when I stood in that altar and lifted my hands he said I can't describe it but I felt like this is home and I've been here before God filled him with the Holy Ghost that service and he was baptized in Jesus name his whole life, he thought, I'm first generation Pentecost. Until he was at a conference, somebody walked up to him and said, you look so familiar. He said, are, are, are you, do you have pastors in your family? Brother Sergeant said, no, 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 I, I'm first generation Pentecost. The man says, wow, that's, what's your last name? Darren Sargent's. Are you serious? No, no, you're not related to the one-armed sergeant, right? No, 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 we're from Oregon. I was born and raised in Oregon. This pastor said, oh my word. He said, no, 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 no. I'm telling you, you're not first generation Pentecost. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, your grandfather wasn't just a Pentecostal preacher, but you're grandfather planted churches in Northern California, in Washington State, and in Oregon. 
Your grandfather passed away and he was one of the great Pentecostal preachers in that entire area and he was well known. He said, I know your mama. Your mama backslid when she was 16 years of age because she was pregnant with you. And I know what happened. Something transpired and brought you back. You know why? He said, your grandfather prayed every day of his life until his death that God would bring back the prodigal in his life. Mama didn't make it back, but grandson, oh, hear me, and grandkids made it back. Let me tell you something. Don't you give up on your prayer. You may not see the prodigal that you're reaching for, but it's going to be a descendant of the prodigal that you're reaching for. So you keep praying and you keep reaching. I wish there was somebody right now as you stand to your feet that would close your eyes and there would be a name and a face begin to begin form of a backslider that you're still connected to. Maybe it's a Jeremy Scott that you've been working with and working on for 20 years and they're so far, they're so far in the darkness and perversion and sin. You may not think that they're ever going to make it back, but I wish right now you'd begin to speak their name before the throne of God and say in the name of Jesus, God, I'm asking you to reach into that prodigal's life. God, I want, oh, is there somebody here that you're not willing to give up, but you're willing to step out of your pew and say, come on, I'm not giving up. I want to make sure I have a revelation of my identity. I'm going to stay in the church. I'm going to stay in the church and I'm going to reach the prodigal. I'm going to believe that God's going to bring him back. Come on, that's it. Once you've got a name, you've got a face, I want you to make your way down to the front. Because you're making a commitment right here now. You're making a commitment. Come on, that prodigal needs you. That prodigal needs you in the church. That prodigal needs you consistent. That prodigal needs you prayed up. That prodigal needs you full of the Holy Ghost. That prodigal needs you healthy. That prodigal needs you waiting. That prodigal needs you ready. Come on, there needs to be someone that says, I'm not walking away. I'm not giving up on the prodigal. I'm going to stay where I know I need to stay because I've got to reach them with the gospel. Come on, that's it, a revelation of identity. A revelation of identity. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, that's it, somebody cry out unto God. Somebody cry out unto God.
I want us to keep this atmosphere, this atmosphere of prayer, so keep praying. But I, I just want you to listen to this. One of my biggest anxieties about prodigals is the fact that yes, they're in God's hands, but it's not God's hands I'm worried about, it's theirs. God is a perfect gentleman and we have been given free will. And that is such a blessing, but it can be such a curse. But as I was praying, the verse that God laid on my heart was Psalms 23, 6, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I know this, that the prodigals that are not here with us today, the prodigals in your life, the lost sheep, while they're not answering the call, while they have shut the door, goodness and mercy are still knocking. Goodness and mercy are following them no matter where they go. Goodness and mercy constantly pursues. God is constantly with them. Goodness and mercy are whispering. Goodness and mercy is knocking. So we're gonna have the faith, the faith enough to rejoice and praise like it's already done because God operates outside of time and space. Goodness and mercy operates outside of time and space. So in this atmosphere, let's just praise Him like it's already done because for Him it already is. Goodness and mercy are pursuing them. Goodness Goodness and mercy are knocking. Jesus, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the ones that are not here today that are going to be here next year. We thank you for the ones that are going to show up on Sunday. Mess and all, but goodness and mercy brought them to us. Goodness and mercy brought them here, and we're going to welcome them with open arms. We will not grow bitter because we have stayed faithful. We will welcome them as healthy fathers in the name of Jesus thank you thank you Jesus for pursuing them when they close the door thank you Jesus for your goodness and mercy share something um, I am exactly what Kaylin and Brother Gallion just talked about uh, I never really walked away totally from church but I was very distant from God I was around but I wasn't connected and first off I just want to say thank you to some of you uh, for your consistency because your consistency showed me the power of God. And I'm thankful for that. But they wanted me to share just kind of, I guess, where I was. Um, I, was I was extremely lonely. I was extremely lonely. You know, I was, I was around church. I was around the people of God. But I was lonely. I tell you what, as soon as I kind of started venturing out and kind of stepping away, it just, it got worse. It got way worse, actually. It, it got scary. Uh, and then uh, eventually, uh, I didn't know this, but you know, part of your message you mentioned about people that have been praying for you for, well, I had many people praying for me, but I had gone to Florida to tell my grandparents that I was walking away from church and I didn't want anything to do with this anymore. I was done. And little did I know that my grandma <laughs> was up praying all night and she called our assistant pastor back home that I grew up, the church I grew up at. Um, and they were praying all night. I didn't know that. I, I, was, I was asleep and I was about to leave. I was about to go to Tennessee and just pursue the things of this world. But I'm, I'm so thankful, I'm just so thankful that I had people in my life that were praying for me when I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it. A few, 
few days later, um, I went, there was, there was a service my grandpa was preaching at. I went and kind of went through the motions. Um, and then they had a Sunday night service. And uh, I went thinking like, this is, this is my last service, right? This is, I just got to push through. I just got to push through and go through the motions. And um, God knocked me on my face because he interrupted that service and he said, you're not alone. He said, you're not alone. He said, he, he interrupted the service and the pastor was supposed to preach, but the bishop said, sorry, son, I'm going to preach. I got, I got a word from God. The word of God was, it was for me and I, I was fighting it, but the, the word of God was for me. And he said, uh, I don't know who's in here tonight, but uh, you're feeling extremely lonely. You're feeling lost. You're feeling you don't, you don't know what to do. Um, and I knew what I needed to do. And uh, I went down to the altar and I just fell on my face before God because for the first time in my life, I felt the peace of God like I had never felt in my life. And I've, I've, I've not turned back since. And I hold on to the peace of God. So I want somebody tonight to hold on to the peace of God. It's in this room. It's in this room. And if you want it, it's right here. Let's pray for the peace of God real quick. In Jesus' name, God, I pray right now, God, anybody in this room, God, that needs your peace, God, that feels lonely tonight, God, I pray, Lord, they don't know what to do, the direction to go, but I, I pray that you would give them the peace that passes understanding, God. Lord, it didn't make sense where I was, God, but you, you met me right where I needed to, Jesus. I pray that the peace of God would reign so strongly in this room, and thank you for your mercy and your grace, God. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. We love you and we appreciate you. Thank you, Jesus. I leaned over to my wife during the message tonight and I showed her a text that I had sent to somebody that is a prodigal just, just this week, just this past Thursday. She said, huh. Pulled out her phone. She sent somebody a text on Monday. Talked to Reese. He said, hey, just a couple weeks ago, I talked to, I say that to say this, ladies and gentlemen, that what we heard tonight, he's already doing a work. And he said, it's not up to the youth pastor, the youth staff, but I want you guys to know that we are actively involved in what he preached about tonight. We're not asking you to do something that we're not doing ourselves. You guys are going to be a part of an incredible miracle. This youth group, this hyphen group is going to be a part of an incredible miracle that we're going to see people back that we thought would never, we would never see them again. But I felt that so strong in the Holy Ghost that there is a revival of prodigals that are coming. But we've got to be ready. We've got to love them got to celebrate them. Jesus, thank you for the word we heard tonight. Thank you for the reminder that there are people that are outside of these four walls that need you, that need us to love them like you love, that we need to be like that father that's looking out the window. We, we don't know when they're going to be coming home, but but when we see them coming down the road, we, we want to leave the comfort of where we are and go meet them. And it may be a messy situation. It may be a difficult situation. But God, we know that you are going to give us the strength and the wisdom to navigate that process with them as they are drawn back into the house. Lord, I'm asking that you would, if we can just be transparent, Jesus, help us to avoid bitterness of Maybe somebody's not paying enough attention to me. Somebody's not giving me enough focus because this person who's been gone, now they're getting all the attention. Jesus, help us overcome those thoughts because we have the promises. We have the blessings. But Lord, let us, let us celebrate. Let us rejoice when the prodigals come home. God, I believe in the name of Jesus that this time next year, we're going to see people sitting in this room, that this time they are living in the world 
and they're smoking all kinds of stuff and they're drinking all kinds of stuff and, and they're involved in all kinds of things that, that, that do, they do not need to be involved with, but, but we're gonna see them in this room with us. And it's gonna be because there's a few people that made up their mind that we're gonna love. We're gonna, we're gonna be servants. We're, we, 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 we're gonna do what we can to serve and love like you love. Thank you, Lord, for that reminder tonight. Thank you for that word we heard tonight. Thank you for confirming, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in this weekend. And Lord, we know there are great things yet to come. We give you all the praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. And I said in Jesus' name, amen. Brother Galleon, thank you for that word tonight. Thank you. It's got to be a little difficult coming into a youth retreat with a message about prodigals on your heart. So thank you for being sensitive to, to the Holy Ghost because you are talking to prodigals in here. Amen, amen. All right.